Hi, and thanks for joining us for another one of Family Marines videos. My name's Tom, and uh, we're back in our shop today, and we're going to go through a competitor's boat and show you some of the things that Barletta's do differently than some of the other brands that are out on the market. So I'm not going to name names. I'm not going to pick on anybody. I'm just going to show you some bare facts, okay? Uh, this is a boat that's called a 2585. So of course that means it's a 25 foot boat and it's eight and a half feet wide. Now it's on the internet that it has 25 inch diameter tubes, but we're going to do some measuring. We're going to take a look at some different things and we're going to show you what the, some of the differences are. Okay, we're going to measure the overall length of the tube. So we're we're not going to measure the very back of the tube because that cone that sticks out the back doesn't add any buoyancy whatsoever. So we're going to go right to the edge of the end of the tube and we're going to measure and see what we really have here. So this is, this is 24 feet right to here. So this is the splash guard. To the top of this, to the tip of the splash guard, this boat is 23 feet 8 in, or the tube is 23 feet 8 inches. But if we measure to the actual tube right up on top here, we're coming up with roughly 23 feet 3.5 inches, 23 feet 4 inches, roughly in there. Okay, so what they're measuring, okay, Parker, go to the deck. What they're measuring when they call it a 25, is they're measuring the deck length. You can see that this deck length is 25 feet. Now, in retrospect, Barletta, and well, we'll go out and measure one, when they tell you it's a 23 footer, for example, they're measuring the length of the tube, saying that the tube length is 23, but the deck length is a little over 25. We'll go measure one for in a minute. Now, the brochure says that this is a 25 inch diameter tube, but as I measure it, it's 24 inch diameter tube, two feet. Okay, so that's one of the ways to cut costs. Okay, now, um, this boat does have underwater lights. Yeah, I like those, those are nice. Um, I'm not sure what's going on with these transom tie down straps. Um, so apparently, they're holding this thing up. I don't know. Maybe that's just a storage area because he doesn't want to use them or something. I don't know why he's got not holding the boat to the trailer. It's supposed to go down here. All right. This little uh, support bar underneath here, there's one of those on each side that's supporting the rear of the transom or the rear of the deck. Um, so what that kind of tells me is that this must be a weak point. They must feel there's too much flex in the deck of the boat, so they have to add this support bar underneath here. Now, some other things that I want to take note of is this black anodized aluminum is anodized where this aluminum corner casting is powder coated. Okay, now aluminum corner castings, yeah, they're more susceptible to cracking, breaking when you bang into the dock. They do have a nice size stainless steel pop-up cleat and uh, here's another ring for uh, tying your boat bumper to. Now you'll notice, although we've got this one with anti-chafing tape because we're about to shrink wrap it, you'll notice that the sheet metal is on the outside of the boat, which means that the sheet metal is closer to the dock, possibly causing dock rash. This is smooth sheet metal and the problem, the good thing with smooth sheet metal is it looks nice. Everybody loves the appearance of the smooth sheet metal. The problem is that it is not very forgiving. Even the slightest little dent stands out like a sore thumb. So one of the things that this brand of boat does is you'll notice how they move the fencing in two, three inches from the edge of the rub rail. Okay. Now, that's to help prevent the damage to the fencing. But the problem is, is that we're, we lose four to six inches of space inside the cockpit of the boat by moving the fencing in. Now, you'll also notice that this has a blackout package, yet the rails are powder coated. And powder coating aluminum 
tends to have a chafing problem down the road. The bimini top frame is anodized, and of course the rub rail is anodized, and they didn't even do anything with the skirting. It's just a plain old aluminum skirting that they have. Now, let's take a look at the structure. If we look underneath the deck, we'll see that this is hat channel. And hat channel is actually pretty good material to be building a boat out of. 3 16 inch thick aluminum, so that's acceptable. But you'll notice that there's a hat channel every 24 inches not every 16 inches like a lot of boats have. The 16 inch on center cross members are much, much stronger because there's more of them in the boat, creating a stronger chassis, which ultimately gives you a smoother ride, less vibration. Okay, another thing to take note of is notice these snaps. So all the way around the boat, the playpen cover on this boat snaps on. These are very inexpensive. They've been around for 100 years. Where most companies today are going with the clips that clip into the rail. And when we get out and show you a Barletta, I'll show you what I mean by the clips. But here's the problem with these. Often we see them come in for service where these snaps are banged up from the hitting the dock because they're protruding out the side of the boat. Very easy for that to happen. Often these snaps up here, I don't know if you've ever put a cover on a pontoon before, or a boat in general, but these snaps can become very difficult to put on and take off. And sometimes when you pull the snap, the cover off the snap, part of the snap stays on the boat and the other half splits away from in the canvas and you end up having to replace the snap that's in the canvas. So yeah, people really don't care for the uh, snaps. They like the clips much, much better. Okay, you'll notice these welded on extruded aluminum pieces. And the reason that they're putting on them on is to strengthen the nose cone of the tube. Um, it, it, yes, strengthening the nose cone of the tube is important, but I don't know why they don't do that on the inside of the tube so it's not obtrusive like this one is. I'm, I'm not a fan of that appearance. Some people might say that, well, it helps with spray deflection, but that's what, that's what the splash pins are for. Okay, so um, here's an example of what I mean by the sheet metal being on the outside of the fencing. And you'll notice this silver stripe here. It really doesn't, I don't understand why it's even there, other than the fact that the sheet metal slides down in between this silver stripe and the, and the uh, fencing frame, and then it's pressed in to the sheet metal in order to hold the sheet metal in place. Now, I don't see any foam tape in there. What most brands of boats do is they apply foam tape so that down the road the sheet metal doesn't rattle. Okay, That is an issue with sheet metal, particularly down the sides of the boat. They tend the sheet metal can rattle without any foam tape in there. Okay, so here we are up in the bow of the pontoon. And uh, one of the first things that I want to point out is the foam in the seats. It's soft, and some people might think, oh, that's nice. But I'm sitting here for like five, 10 seconds, and my butt's bottoming out on the bottom of the seat base. Imagine what it would be like if you were sitting here for an hour or more. Um, I do like the appearance of the seat bases in this boat. They're very attractive. They did a nice job. They've got four speakers up in the front. They've got venting for the storage compartments cup holders it looks nice but what you got to realize is this is plastic okay and that is part of the frame of the seat base so let's take a look underneath the seats and see what we find out okay this one's full of life jackets but you'll see the aluminum frame let's take a look at the other side see if we can get a little better picture there's a little better picture You'll see the aluminum frame that, that, that instead of a rotocast like most companies use, this company is using aluminum frames. Now, here's the problem with that. Everything that you put in these storage compartments sits on the floor of the boat. So if it rains out or if you know, the family's running in and out of the boat with wet swimsuits, blah, 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 all your equipment that's stored 
inside the storage compartment is going to get wet. If it rains, water goes easily goes inside of that. Down in here you can see the inside of that plastic covering that covers the front of the seat base. That's all plastic. Okay. A stamped um, I don't even know what to call that. Um, it's not stitching, but it's stamped into the vinyl. It's not stitching like what some companies use. Let's take a look at the helm. This is an all-plastic helm. There's no fiberglass. Most manufacturers today are using a fiberglass helm. Now, here's the downside of a plastic helm. Corey, if you keep an eye on this dash panel, look at the flex. Down the road, that can be a problem. Things loosen up, things rattle, etc., etc. Down here, yeah, they got some good leg room. I like leg room. I need leg room in my pontoon because I want to stretch out. I don't want to feel like I'm sitting in an airplane. Downside is this panel right here. They do that for support of the council. So as I'm getting out of the helm, I'm constantly hitting my feet on that. But it is better than some where the helm goes straight down and you end up sitting like this for long periods of time. They did do a nice job installing the flush mount mercury control box. I like that, it's very attractive. Helm comes back. This is uh, a separate piece, a separate plastic piece from the helm itself. Um, cup holders, uh, fill for the uh, hydraulic st uh, steering reservoir, uh, Garmin, I'm sure that's a colored GPS depth finder. They do have a speedometer with a trim gauge and a fuel gauge. They do have a tachometer with a built-in um, LCD screen. I'm not sure if by pushing those buttons it will change the, what you can see. I'm guessing that you'd be able to see like a voltmeter or maybe an hour meter. Fusion stereo, yeah, pretty decent stereo. Six speakers in this boat, so yeah, I hand it to them for that. Couple of USB jacks here. Um, another USB jack with an eighth inch jack there. This one's more than likely hooked to the stereo so you can listen to your music on your phone via a cord. And I'm sure that, yeah, this is a Bluetooth stereo. It does have a bilge pump. I'm guessing that this is for the center tube. I'm guessing that that would be an automatic float switch on the bilge pump so if you're not tending the boat and you get rainwater in the center tube that it would automatically pump it out. Here's our up and down for our power bimini, our underwater lights, etc. Yeah, they did a nice job, right? Mood lights. There are some LED lights on the inside of the boat. So now we go to the back of the pontoon and um, Okay, here's what we're doing for this customer. Um, the boat came with your standard run-of-the-mill battery on-off switch, which is this switch here. You've got off, battery number one, all, and battery number two. Now, this boat has sea legs on it, and so what they did was, if you take a look at the battery behind you, the dealer that sold this boat put in a deep cycle battery, which is a trolling motor battery, for the engine. Wrong, 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 wrong. They did put in a cranking battery for the sea legs, which is correct, but here's the difference. A deep cycle battery is designed to deliver a little bit of amperage for a long period of time, where a cranking motor battery is designed to deliver a lot of amperage for a short period of time. In other words, if you want to start your engine, it takes a lot of amperage to start your engine. So you need a cranking battery for that, not a deep cycle battery. Okay? They did have a, a cranking battery for the sea legs, which yes, 
according to sea legs, you need a cranking battery to operate the sea legs. Now, this switch is a basic simple switch. The problem with this switch is, let's say you use your sea legs three, four, five times, and now you want to charge, now because sea legs use a lot of amperage out of the battery, you want to charge that battery up. So you would think, okay, I'll switch it to all. That way the alternator on the engine charges both batteries. But the problem with that is the amperage from the alternator on the engine is now divided by two batteries. So let's say it's a 50 amp alternator. You're only getting 25 to each battery. Well, wait a minute. This is the starting motor battery over here. This is the Celex battery. This is the one that's wore down. We don't want to charge this one. We want to charge this one. And yet I have 25 amps going to each battery. I run the potential risk of ruining this battery by overcharging it and it takes twice as long to charge the Celex battery. So what we're doing is we are installing, well, we can't see it right now because we're about halfway done putting it in, is a battery on off switch with what's called a voltage sensitive relay. So the voltage sensitive relay, what that does is it senses which of the two batteries needs the current from the alternator and sends it to that specific battery without sending it to this, this battery and overcharging and potentially ruining it. So it takes, let's say all 50 amps from that alternator are going to the battery that needs it and it takes half the time to recharge that battery. So of course, um, the reason that we're doing this is because the customer complained that his Celex battery was going dead all the time. Well, yeah, when half your current's going to the wrong deep cycle battery, it should be a cranking battery, and half the amperage from the alternator is going to the, to the Celex battery, it's gonna take a long time to recharge that Celex battery. So again, that is the reason for a voltage sensitive relay. And whenever we install dual batteries, particularly with Celex in a pontoon, we have the option, and most people choose to do this, is to go with the voltage sensitive relay because it does all the charging to the proper battery for you. Okay, this boat does have the optional power electric bimini top. Now, uh, all Barletta's come standard with a power electric bimini top, but I want to point out something here. Um, this bimini does not have the front support bars to hold the, when a, when a bimini is up and opened up, it does not have the support bars that go down to the fencing on the pontoon. I'll show you that when we get out to look at the barlettas. Now, somewhere on this bimini top, there's a sticker that says, do not exceed 25 miles an hour. Why? Well, with the bimini top open into a headwind, it's possible, and I've had it happen to me, that the wind will collapse that bimini. It literally bends right here at the joint and ruins it. That's why they put a sticker on there that says do not exceed 25 miles an hour. Well, here's the thing you gotta think about that. Let's say you got a, you're, going, you're doing 20 miles an hour into a 10 mile an hour headwind. <laughs> now you're doing 30. Is it possible to collapse that bimini top when it's open? Yes, it is. Okay, so here we are back on our show floor and we're gonna measure up a 23 foot Barletta. So again, just like we did a little bit ago, we're not gonna measure the end cap, we're gonna measure the weld because that is where we get support from the tube. Okay, so we're going to go to the very tip of the tube and we're actually coming up with roughly 23 feet two inches. Okay, so when Barletta says this is a 23-footer, yep, yep, the tubes are 23 feet long. Let's go up to the deck. So we go to the deck, and now, Parker, if you, go t if you look at the deck in the back, it angles towards the engine. So stretch it out to there. You there? Okay, so here, if we measure the curve, the very bow of the boat, we have a 25-foot deck. 
23, uh, 24, 8 to the corners, 25 feet when you go to the curve to the center of the, of the deck of the pontoon. Okay, this model being a Corsa, Corsa is advertised as 26 inch diameter tubes. And if you take a look at the tape measure, we have exactly 26 inches. Okay. Okay, so this is an Aria. Arias and Cabrios have 25 inch diameter tubes. And as you can see, this one measures exactly 25 inches. So they advertise 25, 26, 23 with a 25 inch foot deck you get what you pay for, right? We're not shortcutting like some other brands are out there. Somebody that says, yeah, they're 25 inch diameter tubes. Well, you know, if you measure uh, down there, gra grab hold of that, around, now I got a 26 inch. Well, that's not right. This is a 25 inch tube, but when I measure around the, the, no the end cap, it gives me that extra inch. Yeah, that's not right. So, again, Barletta's giving you what you pay for. Let's take a look at the inside. Okay, before we go into the inside, I want to point out some things on the outside. Stainless steel corner castings. Much, much stronger than aluminum, so when you bang them into the dock, they're less susceptible to breaking or cracking. You'll notice how the fencing on the Barletta is brought right out to the edge of the pontoon. Why can we do that? Why do we do that? Of course, because our sheet metal is on the inside of the frame, less susceptible to damage. Yet, as I talked about in there, where that other brand of boat, they moved their fencing in two, three inches, we're maximizing the interior space of the pontoon because our fencing has moved all the way out to the outer edge. Now, this boat does have a blackout package on it, similar to that one. Although, the aluminum here is anodized. So the fencing, the bimini top frame, the rub rail, and the skirting. They didn't anodize or powder coat their skirting, did they? Um, so that's part of the blackout package. Anodized, not powder coated. All right? Um, yes, we give you the little removable cleats to tie your boat bumper to so you can easily tie the rope of your boat bumper to this clip and easily pop them in and out and if we take a look at the back the courses and the lusos come standard with the boat bumper baskets this is where you store your boat bumper when you're not using it again we have pop-up cleats just like they did there's another one of our boat bumper cleats um, heavy-duty extruded aluminum, not sheet metal. There are brands of pontoons out there that use sheet metal, and the problem with sheet metal is when you do a nose dive due to having too many people in the bow of the boat, the sheet metal tends to just fold right up, rendering it useless. Now, you can't see it, but on the inside of all the Barletta nose cones are aluminum brackets welded in similar to what you saw on the outside of that competitor's boat. We like to put them on the inside because it gives it a better appearance and adds strength all at the same time. Okay, um, this is an example of a double I-beam cross member. So this is the, a sample of what goes all the way from port to starboard on top of the tubes. This right here is called a saddle bracket. This is welded on top of the tube. There's one on the outside of the tube, and there's one on the inside of the tube, and then the cross member goes all the way over. Now, Barletta's use a lot of double I-beam. The one that we saw inside had hat channel, which is, a, in my opinion, much better than C-channel. C-channel is, of course, just this, a C, right? And um, that one was every 24 inches. Barletta's, all with the exception of the Arias, are every 16 inches. Now, not all of the cross members are double I-beam. Barletta uses, depending on the model of the boat, we'll use a lot of double I-beams. 
we'll use some I-beam and we'll use some C-channel depending on the model of the boat and the horsepower rating. The higher the horsepower rating, the more double I-beams they're going to use. So for example, a 200 horsepower motor doesn't require as many double I-beams as what a 400 horsepower motor does. Does that make sense? And as I said, with the exception of the Arias, they're putting them every 16 inches, except in the back. Back of the pontoon is where all the torque from the motor is used up, right? So often they'll go every 12 inches, every six inches. They'll put in whatever it needs to be able to support that horsepower rating for the particular boat that we're talking about. Um, that's why they can offer a lifetime chassis warranty. We just don't have chassis issues with our Barlettas. Now, the other thing that they do, you'll see here it says VIP technology. Vi vibration isolation pad. You'll see right under here this black line. That's actually a rubber pad in between the cross member and the saddle bracket that's welded to the tube. Now, I got to admit, when I first heard about this, I thought, yeah, there's a bunch of smoke and mirrors. But I'm here to tell you, it's massive. The amount of vibration uh, 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 reduction because of these rubber pads is phenomenal. I did not know how phenomenal it was until I took my first bar letter for a ride and went, my God, these things don't vibrate at all. There's no gate rattle. The dash isn't rattling. Um, uh, it's, just, it's just, there's no rattle. There's no vibration. And that's a lot to do with the strength of the chassis, the double I-beams, and the vibration isolation pad. Now, here's another little feature. You notice the foot pads, okay? So these foot pads, you know, they're mounted on top of the round part of the tube. That's why it's curved. So what Barletta is able to do is weld each foot pad on the outside and on the inside, inside, outside. That way we get double the strength of the uh, saddle bracket being welded to the tube. I have seen brands of boats without a foot pad and this piece of the metal is welded to the tube and through the pounding that a pontoon can take across the water, this sheet metal literally embeds itself straight down into the sheet metal of the tube, creating leaks, cracked welds, things like that. So that's why Barletta uses a foot pad on the bottom of their saddle bracket. Okay, so now here we are in the bow of a Corsa. And for those of you who may not be familiar with the models from Barletta, I'll quickly run through them. Barletta enters the market with an Aria. The next step up is a Cabrio, then a Corsa, then a Lusso, and then the, uh, what's it called, Corey? Reserve. The Reserve. Yeah, that's that fiberglass, oh boy. That's a $250,000, $300,000 boat. It's gorgeous. Okay, but starting in the front. Now, Barletta uses multi-density foam. So when you first sit in this, you might think, wow, that kind of feels hard. But what's happening is as you sit in it, it's slowly sinking down, but it's not sinking down to the point where you bottom out on the board, like that other one. That was a, a single density foam, and it was a very soft foam. So as soon as I sat in that boat, bam, I, my butt was bottoming out. Here, I'm not even close to bottoming out, okay? You'll notice that this is real stitching, okay? It's not the pressed stitching like what we saw on that boat in the shop. That's real stitching. Underneath our seats are roto-molded seat bases. Why do we use that? Well, number one is it keeps our gear up off the floor. That way it's dry. There are drain tracks, so if it did rain out, the water would channel away from the storage compartment. But even if you did get something, water, or put something wet down in there, there's drain tracks down at the bottom of the rotocast seat bases, and it'll drain out the deck of the pontoon. That way your gear stays dry. And yes, it is vented, so you get some air move, airflow through there. Notice how the bifold seat hinge so it folds the seat down out of our way. Now this one, they can't do that. And most boats use a single hinge like that. 
So if you can imagine this seat base being this high with a single hinge like that other one in there had, it's much more difficult to lean over that and reach down into your storage compartment, right? Now, on the other one, being aluminum frame, they had a piece of metal going here, dividing this. So if you have something long to get in and out of, of this storage compartment, that crossbar there is in your way. It's not going to work. All right. This boat being a um, Corsa Ultra Lounge also has six speakers like the one inside, two in the front, two there, and two hanging out the back. Okay, let's go to the helm. Fiberglass, not plastic, one piece, elevated, got the rubber pad on top, the non-slip rubber pad, plenty of leg room, doesn't have the piece coming down here that you get your feet caught on every time you get in and out of the seat. Because it's a fiberglass helm, it's so much stronger. Remember the other one when I pulled on the wheel? You had so much flex up in here. There's no flex. I'm pulling harder on this one than I pulled on that one. There's zero flex. This particular boat has a flush mounted Simrad G07. Fully functional. We even get engine diagnostics off of that Simrad instead of the Garmin, which is just your basic run of the mill. Depth finder, color, GPS might give you a little bit more like a digital readout of the depth or a water temperature or maybe a compass or something, but it's not nearly as fully functional as what this one is. This one we did order in with the RGB interior light package, so all the cup holders and underneath the seats are RGB LED lights. And this little knob over here controls that we can change colors. Now, um, here's the reason I chose this boat to compare with the boat in the shop. The customer that bought the boat in the shop, before he bought it, he was here shopping us on a 23-foot Corsa by Barletta. And um, he left and he went out and he bought that boat. And when he brought it in last week for service, we were talking to him and he said, well, yeah, I saved $25,000 from the cost of the Barletta Corsa. Yeah, it's not near the boat. I got to admit that that brand of boats did a pretty good job on making that boat look good. But there's so many features on that boat that don't come close to the way that Barletta builds their boats. It's, it's mind boggling. You know, that's maybe a 10 year boat. This is a 20 year boat, 30 year boat. This is a boat that's built for a lifetime. It's just, it is not an inexpensively built boat. Barletta put so much forethought into each and every minor detail of these pontoons. If you took the factory tour and listened to some of the guys, some of the things that they're saying about how they construct these boats, the materials that they use, it's mind boggling. It's absolutely mind boggling. Like I said, these are boats built for the long haul. Okay, this is that Bimini support bar that I was talking about inside. They did not have this. So when this Bimini top is open, what you do is you grab hold of this bar and this little round clip here goes down into this clip bolted to the fencing. That's what holds the Bimini top open as you're ripping across the lake at 40, 45, 50 miles an hour, depending on the engine that you have on it, right? You don't have to worry about the Bimini top collapsing. Heck, I've pulled these things down the highway with the Bimini open and this support bar in place at 55 miles an hour and not had a problem. If I remember correctly, I believe that um, Schwintech, the maker of this Bimini top, raced them at 70 miles an hour. Don't hold me to that. I'm not exactly sure. That's been a, quite a few years since I think I saw that. I'm getting old, I can't remember everything. <laughs> um, over here on the helm, 
Barletta uses a different style of binnacle mount for the control box. Okay, it is a flush mount, very attractive looking, um, very ergonomic. Um, it's right next to the driver's arm on the armrest here. It's easy to access the throttle control by the driver. So this is, you know, the one inside had the uh, side mount, flush mount control box, which is nice too. Um, either one, I think, works just as well. Okay, um, battery switch. <coughs> All the Corsas and Lusos come standard with dual batteries and therefore have a battery on off switch that's a dual battery and has a voltage sensitive relay as standard. Where the Arias and the Cabrios do not have a voltage sensitive relay as standard because they come with one battery. There are times that we add the second battery because a customer may buy sea legs and as I mentioned earlier, sea legs use a lot of amperage out of the battery and we want to be able to charge that battery quickly and easily and therefore when we add a second battery for sea legs we suggest to people that they also add the voltage sensitive relay that way the amperage is not divided between the two batteries it's going to the one battery that needs it the most. Okay, um, the ladder that I mentioned on that customer's boat that was in the shop. Uh, the Barletta Arias and the Cabrios use the same ladder. It's a very good ladder. Where when you get to the Corsas or the Lusos, you get the upgraded lily pad heavy duty ladder that goes out at a very much of an angle. Look how wide the foot treads are on that ladder. And uh, that's what we call a pet friendly ladder. So it goes down at an angle and the treads are real wide so that your pets can crawl up the ladder when they're out swimming. <laughs> and you can actually take that ladder and get a second mount mounted underneath the bow of the pontoon so you can move the ladder from the front, or excuse me, from the back to the front should you desire to do that. Okay, so in closing, um, the old adage, you get what you pay for. Yes, you can find less expensive boats that are out there um, versus Barletta. Uh, there's, there's lots of them. Uh, but if you're looking to get a boat that's going to hold up for the long haul, that's going to have a tremendous resale value, um, check out the Barlettas. So if you'd like to check them out, if you'd like to call us, you can certainly reach us, Corey, the guy behind the camera, or myself. Uh, give us a call at area code 320-222-BOAT. That's 222-2628. You can see us on the web, which is familymarineboats.com. All of our inventory is listed there. Many of them, have, most of them have a video attached to it. And of course, we're on YouTube. You go to YouTube, you search Family Marine Wilmer. You'll see our icon, click on that, and you'll find, golly, over 100 videos on our YouTube channel. So all of these are educational videos, hopefully teaching you the things that you need to know before you purchase a pontoon, why things are important, the benefits of each and every item throughout the whole pontoon. So with that said, thank you very much for watching.